Welcome, everybody, to Drive Through Sports with Adam and Paul. It is Tuesday, Cinco de Mayo, 2020. And as strange as it is on Cinco de Mayo, everybody wants to go and eat Mexican food. And, and of course, I'm a huge fan of Mexican food. So my family, they love it, too. So they're like, hey, call the Mexican restaurant. Um, go pick some up. So I get on the phone and call the Mexican restaurant. And I said, uh, I need to place an order for carryout. They're like, um, we're not taking any carryout orders. And I'm like, what? <laughs> it's like 745. She goes, um, we're just really backed up. She's like, but you can call back at like 830. And I was like, <laughs> look, lady, I'm going huh? to have eaten something else by then. But uh, yeah, so Cinco de Mayo, I can't even get any Mexican food on a carryout deal. Mm. Yeah. So anyway, uh, Adam Freeman in Atlanta, Georgia. Paul Brees is in actually in his home tonight. In Brentwood, Tennessee, running on generator power from Big Papa. <laughs> <laughs> Big Daddy. Big Daddy. Big Daddy. <laughs> Big Daddy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Backwards. Um, but, yeah, big storm, and you've been without power for how long now? Um, coming on 52 hours. Wow. Wow. So, but, hey, just just like the trooper that he is. He makes you stronger. He's pressing on, baby. Uh, and we are pressing on with our broadcast. And as you can see, Tonight's theme is a little bit different. The first live sports I have seen in since uh, since March the 12th, I think, um, was the game, the replay. Actually, it wasn't even live because it was live at 5.30 this morning. I was not waking up for that. And they re-aired the game between the uh, NC Dinos and the Samsung Lions, uh, in which the Dinos uh, took four to nothing. Uh, on the powerful bat of Hung Jung Na. <laughs> hey, how about that? How about that bat flip? I love it. I love. Listen, I mean, so Korean baseball is always been kind of like you know one tier lower than than uh, than Major League Baseball because you don't have the big, you know. And one thing I noticed about it, I did watch it. Now, right. catch. Let me interject this. You said right. one tier lower. I'm thinking double A. Uh, well, it's always been viewed as it's not on the same level, and it's not. Don't get me wrong. It's not. The, the um, pitchers are throwing mid-80s. Yeah, they're throwing 88, 90 miles an hour. So, I mean, the they're not throwing nearly as hard, um, and you don't have you don't have the, the big power hitters that you have in Major League Baseball. But what you do have, and what I noticed, and I only watched from the seventh inning on, what you do have is really, really good fundamentals, which, you know, in America, nobody really cares about fundamentals um, anymore, uh, especially in baseball. But they play really good defense, and the pitchers throw strikes. And what's funny, like, one of the games today, there were eight games, or six games, I think, over there. One of the games, you're going to like this, Paul, two hours, nine minutes. I love it. Shortest game, shortest opening day game in Korean baseball organization history. Now, the game that I watched, just under three hours, two hours, 58 minutes. That's okay. Yeah, but they go up there, pitchers throw strikes, they go up there swinging the bat. You know, it's, it's, it's just different. The pace is different. Um, you know, the, the monotonous throws over to first like you hate. Um, they're not there. Now, what I also noticed about it was – there's a lot more uh, marketing going on. On like the, the uniforms are billboards essentially, kind of like the NBA has morphed into now. Um, and do you uh, do you know the reason behind that, Paul? I would I would speculate to think it was uh, the marketing was based upon players' salaries or. Well, they have they actually have no salary cap, which is interesting. Okay. Um, but these teams, you'll know, they are. I mean, look at the names of the teams: uh, Samsung, Kia, Doosan. Uh, these are all conglomerate, huge corporations that own these teams. Okay, so like the Samsung Lions, we know them for making you know DVD put. They make everything washer dryers microwaves appliances dishwashers i mean they're huge Doosan produces all types of heavy equipment 
for job site, lighting, forklifts, all kinds of stuff. Um, yeah, so LG also owns a team over there. So it has a very, very heavy corporate influence. Um, and that's, that's why you see a lot of the marketing on the jerseys, um, the, the, the logos, and you look around the stadium, the outfield walls behind, you know, you know, professional major league baseball has started to adopt more of that. Um, but it's really evident when you, when I watch those three innings today and I'll probably watch some more. I mean, it's, it's decent. I mean, I'm not going to like set, set an alarm so I don't miss it or anything, but I mean, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to watch. Um, but yeah, I'm not I'm not setting any alarms to make sure I don't miss miss a pit. Here's a couple of things I found interesting. Uh, one, they played music actually during the pitches. There was <laughs> there was something going on all the time, kind of like an arena football type feel to it. Right, even with no fans. Right, that's the second thing I found interesting were the billboard cutouts that they had put in the stands <laughs> to replicate the fans. Yeah, um, and they, they, and here's an interesting fact about that. Did you know they didn't do that just for this? Those are there anyway during regular games. Yeah. So they're always there. But it was just an interesting, you know, uh, sort of nuance well, to I would say for baseball. a non-Korea baseball organization fan such as myself, go Dinos. But, <laughs> yeah, I did not realize the fact that those were actually up uh, you know, all, all year. Yeah. Yeah. All year, all year. The, the Falcons could use some of those, uh, come this coming season. That might help things out a little bit. Um, <laughs> maybe just put some blow up dolls in there, uh, maybe in some of those empty sections, but, um, yeah, man, it was, uh, it was interesting. Um, and it was not gonna lie. It was good to see some, some, at least tape delayed sports that happened, you know, less than a day ago. Um, speaking of some things that, that happen in sports uh, today, uh, sports lost a, uh, a very uh, sort of pivotal member of the NFL community. Uh, Don Shula uh, coached the Miami Dolphins for years and years uh, and was a, the only coach to coach an undefeated team uh, in 1972, led the Dolphins to a 17-0 and record, and they won – uh, the Super Bowl defeating the Washington Redskins in 1972. He passed today at the age of 90. Uh, still holds the record for 347 all-time wins uh, in the NFL. Um, and what do you – I mean, because when, when he won, when he was at the top of his game, I mean, I was one and you were two, okay? So so we kind of grew up, you know, Watch. I never was really a Dolphins fan. Um, but his teams in the late seventies, then early eighties, then Marino comes and kind of changed things. What, what do you remember about, about Don Shula? Well, obviously the one thing I got hooked on with the dolphins was the uniforms. I mean, to have a dolphin on your helmet, yeah. I felt like that was pretty cool. Yeah. Um, and then the colors, obviously the color scheme was pretty good. Uh, then, well, it, fit, it fit the area, you know, sure. Absolutely. Yeah, tropical sort of feel. Yeah. And, you know, as a seven, eight, nine, ten 10 year old, you don't really cheer for the head coach. Okay. Um, and so obviously I was a Marino guy, man. I, I love the way, you know, he slung it around. And then knowing the fact that Don Shula played a huge part in that success, you know, now I respect that even more. And to just think that, you know, there's a chance in, in our lifetime that no one will replicate the, you know, the undefeated season. Uh, there's, a, yeah, there's a real good chance that that's never going to happen. Yeah. Um, but here's, here's what's interesting about, about that 72 team. Um, you know, I mean, number one, okay, they, they only played 14 regular season games, okay? So, you know, they, obviously they were 14-0. and 0. Um, They did lead the league in scoring that year. Guess what? Guess what they averaged per. Guess what led the league in 1972 in scoring? How many, how many points a game? I'm going to say 16.8. <laughs> oh my gosh, <laughs> it's not that low. Um, <laughs> but 25.7. Actually, if you were dyslexic, you might have got 27.5. Okay, now that's with one game 
where they scored 52. Okay, they beat New England 52 to nothing that year. Um, and what's and I'm another, sure Boston fans would love to see that happen again. Oh, wouldn't they though? But here's what's interesting of the, um, you know, of the games of the regular season game or of all 17 games, even though they led the league in scoring, uh, they only scored over 30 points five times. And if you take away the, the, the anomaly of the 52 point game, um, you know, that would have dropped them down to about 24 points a game. That, and that still would have been probably top three in the league um, back then. Now, so what was, their, what was their secret? Well, their secret was ball control because they only gave up 12.2 uh, points a game, which was also first. So you lead the league in scoring, you lead the league in defense, um, and, and obviously you're going you're gonna to end up champions. And they, in their playoff run, they, they beat the Browns 20-14, to 14, then they beat the Steelers 21-17, and they beat the Redskins 14-7. to 7. So, you know, they only scored 55 points in the playoffs. And you look at some of the games that, that we watch, um, like I, I, the Chiefs Rams game on Monday night was like fifty four to fifty one or something. Yeah. You know, you just don't see that anymore. Um, and so it was a different era. It was a different time. And the fact that Shula was able to coach a team like that, and then stay in the game as long as he did to coach Marino and that high flying offense, just kind of shows his flexibility in the different types of team. And I'll throw some other stats now. Who's the quarterback you remember from that team, the undefeated team? Who was the quarterback? Um, um, I'm supposed to say I don't know, but I you do know. know. You do know. Yeah, I'm, I'm having a 50-year-old moment. <laughs> Come on, he had a son that played at Michigan. I'm drawing a blank, Alex. Oh, geez. What, what, give me the first name. Uh, Bob. Bob Greasy. Jesus. Okay. Okay. But story. listen, but listen, here's what's interesting in, in, in going into this and, and, and going in and researching this, this team, the 72 undefeated team. Greasy only started five games, but everybody ties him to that team. Okay. He only started five, um, five regular season games for them. And um, I just thought that was interesting that the guy that actually started more games um, was uh, Earl Morrill, M-O-R-R-A-L-L, played at Michigan State, was the number two overall pick in the draft in 1956. So he was Whoa. an older guy. 56? 56. 56, yeah. Yeah. Well, we so have to do was, some math, right? Yeah, he was old, dude. Yeah. He was 38, I think, that year. Yeah, he was 38 years old um, during, that, during that run. And, <laughs> you know, it, it just it's, – it's amazing how he's just kind of not really rem – I don't remember. I've never heard of the guy, you well, know. I, I, you know – I think did, – didn't Greasy get hurt, and that's the reason this guy ended up having to play? I think so. I mean, and here's his – listen to this. He only he only attempted – now, now, Patrick Mahomes could do this in a four-game road trip. He attempted 150 passes the entire year. Oh, my goodness. Greasy only attempted 97 – they only threw the ball 259 times that entire year. Now – <clears throat> they did have 2,000 yard rushers in Zonka and Mercury Morris, but when it comes to you know overall like like passing yards, <laughs> 2,200 passing yards, 2,200 yeah. now. That's that's crazy. And uh, Warfield was their leading receiver with 29 receptions, right? <laughs> yeah, 29. Yeah, 29. They had, they had three guys that had over 20. Jim Click had 21, Paul Warfield had 29, and Howard Twilley had 20. You had three guys that had over 20, and nobody had 30 or more. 
I mean, if, you don't, just, if you don't catch over 70 passes in a season, you, you yeah. it's not a good year for, yeah. for a receiver. I mean, you know, it, it's, it's, it's crazy. Like, um, they, they ran for – I mean, if you add their, their, their rushing and their passing – it was just over 5,100 yards. I mean, guys are passing for that now in the league. So you, it just goes to show sort of how the league has, has changed, um, you know, how it's evolved. It's totally a passing league now, which gets us to sort of our next topic. There was sort of a minor bit of news that uh, the Jets signed Frank Gore. Wait, does that surprise you at all? I mean, they got Le'Veon Bell. Um, I mean, he's 37 years old. And does that surprise you at all that they would sign uh, him to a one-year deal? Surprising. I mean, he's immediately going to be the backup easily, right? Well, yeah. I mean, I th- and, and even at age 37, the, dudes, the dude can still play, you know. Um, the third string guy is a guy named Josh Adams out of Notre Dame. So yeah. Yeah. And, what, eight and, carries for 12 yards? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they need somebody dependable that, that they can hand the ball to give Bell a rest. Because, you know, Bell, I mean, he's he's normally – he's not just your third down back. He's there. He, he can be there, you know, every down back. And that's kind of – I think they're just doing that maybe just to give him a little bit of a breather, um, you know, at certain points, uh, certain points during the game. Um, but, you know, maybe it works. You know, maybe it's – you know, maybe he can, you know, run for five, six hundred yards. And uh, did you know he's third overall in rushing career? Yes. Isn't that crazy? Is, it's it is because you know he's a guy that you know coming out of Miami, um, you know, just was just a, a grinder, man. You know, he he would he would carry the ball a lot every year, but just. Just never, he never did break down like a lot of these guys. Uh, a lot of these guys do, and he's, you know, it shows now. I mean, he's still, still going, still cranking. So, um, yeah, man, hats, hats off to him. I hope he, ha- hope he has a good year, um, and and gets closer um, to the overall, to the overall record. Well, I would say this: don't put Frank Gore on your fantasy team. No, <laughs> but no, that- I mean. You know, I think the Jets are going to be pretty bad. <laughs> um, and so, I don't think – I'm not sure this Frank Gore thing is going to take him over the top. But, obviously, uh, what it does show is that the running back position is is is, is tough to find as far as free agents go. Yeah. And I think well, a lot of that is due to the fact that during the draft, I mean, you, how many running backs did you see go in the first round? Right? None. None. You know, a lot of these teams are going O line, D line, wide receiver. Yeah. Unless they need a franchise quarterback, quote unquote. Yeah. They really don't put a lot of stock in running backs. No, and and, and that's kind of been a trend for the last three or four years, um, and that's what it, you know. It's going to be interesting with McCaffrey getting getting his money uh, when these other backs start coming up with him setting that standard, um, you know, when these other guys, when they start, you know, coming around, um, you know, because Zeke got paid and then McCaffrey got paid. Um, Derrick Henry's next. Derrick Henry better be next um, <clears throat> if, if the Titans want to hold on to him because he's a, he's an absolute, absolute monster. Um, and they're going to have to have him to have any success uh, if they're going to win any football games. But um, – yeah, I don't know. I don't know how, you know, the, the, the Frank Gore thing. I mean, he's serviceable, you know, and I think that's at, at this point, I think that's what organizations are looking for, a stopgap, something uh, somebody can plug in there, uh, maybe sub in, you know, a couple times on a drive or whatever. Uh, it's going to have good ball security, not going not gonna to turn the ball over, um, and can run between the tackles. He can obviously do that. So, um well, you know, before Why not you, before roll you dice. move on, I got to tell you this, Adam. I mean, you, you, we talked about just the 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 minimization of not having any quality running backs. Uh, Darrington Evans is the backup quarterback for my Tennessee Titans. 
Who? If who? you don't know who he is, guess who he is? Darrington Evans. Yeah, he just got drafted. Appalachian State. Oh, okay. That just goes to show you that the running back position is 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 tough to find nowadays. Um, yeah, especially and, when when you got teams like Seattle talking <laughs> to a thirty four year old Marshawn Lynch. Listen, trying to work out a deal. Now they. That's not a I, – I mean, obviously, I think it's a better than a Frank Gore signing, but, you know. Well, here's the thing. You're, if you're Seattle, you got nothing in the backfield. No. You're decimated. Penny and Carson are both coming off injury, so you really don't know what you're going to get. Yeah. I mean, a healthy, somewhat in shape Marshawn Lynch it might be better than what they're going to give you or could give you. So – and it's probably going to be really cheap. So – um Bag of Skittles and a million dollars. Bag, bag of Skittles and the six zeros. Yep. I'll come play for you. He told he's. I interviewed him earlier. He said he wasn't sweating it too much. <laughs> <laughs> said I'm not sweating it. <laughs> oh, as we as we uh, get closer to our human interest, I want to remind everybody check out our YouTube channel, uh, Drive Through Sports with Adam and Paul, and our. Uh, check out our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iHeart, and Spotify. As we are getting on up there, um, we need you guys to subscribe uh, and share the content. Uh, hopefully, it is something that's enjoyable for you guys. So, uh, Paul, you had mentioned in the pre-show um, a couple of a couple of things, and if you want to hit on, I know you're dying to hit on this this worst uniforms, uh, worst NBA uniforms. I know that's something that, that you were uh, wanting to talk about. I mean, obviously, we're getting short on time, you know, and I think we've had – we have our core group of fans that are dying for the human interest stuff. All right. Well, if we want to shelf that – Let's I'm do that. Ready. All right, so here's the thing. We'll, 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 do, we'll do worst uniforms. That'll, that'll headline tomorrow along with the uh, chin wing Tigers against the uh, Wusan Giants or whatever, the highlights of that game. But what we're going to talk about here is – we're going to reflect on our best vacation, okay? Best family vacation uh, or otherwise. So, Brees, I'm going to let you start off because this was your topic, so I'm going to let you roll with this. Well, you know, obviously you, you, when you're growing up, you know, you always look toward vacation in the summer. And now when you have kids, you want to try to replicate that where there's a lot of memories. And, you know, I was thinking back of the multiple Disney trips and they would not even be in my top 20. <laughs> um, but uh, there's, so there were two that come to mind. And, you know, if I'd asked my kids, wh what did, who did they, did they enjoy their favorite vacation? I think half of them would say one and half of them would say another. Right. So this past December, uh, we went all out and we all went into uh, the Bahamas. Uh, okay. And uh, we got to celebrate New Year's there, and that was that was kind of a cool deal. Um, and, you know, the little ones flying, it was, it was obviously pretty cool. Yeah. Thing, but, uh, <laughs> you know, there were certain there, – there's certain things that, you know, you, you start out with your oldest one. So, like, okay, when you get out of middle school, we'll take you on a vacation. Will you pick – or when you graduate high school, you can pick, you know, when you have six kids, we ended up with a situation where we had one that graduated from college, high school, and got out of middle school all in the same year. And we ended up doing it over Christmas break. So that was the big shindig. Why we started that, I'm going to blame my wife on that one. But as far as domestic one goes, I, um. We went to uh, San Antonio and had never been there, just did some research. And we stayed at this a great resort. And But my main purpose in going to San Antonio was to go to uh, New Brunsville. New, Br New Brunsville. New Brunsville. Yeah. yeah. Home of Schlitterbahn Water Park. And you know me, <laughs> I'm a huge water park guy. <laughs> You don't want to see me with my shirt off, but check it out. 
Uh, bond for for you novice uh, water parks is, um, you know, it's, it's it's the dream. It's the, the the top, the creme de la creme. He was the he was the water baby growing up. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and I don't know. It was just a, it was it was just fun that we travel all the way in, in, from Nashville to you know San Antonio in my twelve passenger van <laughs> all the way down. And there's nothing between Arkansas and Texas. Oh no! And, yes. Um, you know a lot of you know a lot of things you know in the van take place that. Our, stay, our let's stay in the van. Yeah, the state of it, sure, sure. But uh, San Antonio, uh, you know, I'd highly recommend it. I'd highly recommend it. Well, so, cool. I have to put that on my. I have to put that on the list because I've always heard that the downtown is really nice. Um, but I have to check out that water park. Sounds cool. There's also a water park up in Gatlinburg um, that I want to check out. An indoor water park that I want to check out. I think it's like Camp Wilderness or something like that, or Wilderness. Wilderness Resort. and the Smokies. Wilderness and the Smokies. That's it. Yeah. I. Um, I would be shocked how if if you would if your wife would allow you to go there now. Really? With the new with the with the COVID nineteen. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. The yeah that's gonna change things. It's gonna that's be gonna uh, it's things. gonna be a little dicey probably. Yeah, probably. probably. But yeah. I have, I have to boil the water. <laughs> Extra chlorine. <laughs> oh, there's plenty in there, trust me. Yeah, sure, I bet. Um, I guess, I guess, you know, I was thinking about, uh, you know, my favorite ones and, uh, um, you know, since, you know, since we had kids, we, you know, they, they actually have been, uh, to Hawaii. Uh, I had to work, uh, <laughs> so they went, so I know what theirs would be. Theirs would be the, the Hawaii trip. Uh, and my wife's actually been to Hawaii twice. She went with her sister once, and then she went with her sister and the kids and their cousins and stuff, and they just had a blast. Uh, so I got hosed on that one. But, um, you know, we've been, you know, to Florida and D.C. and uh, Chicago and Orlando. And, um, but my probably, my probably favorite one was I was, I think, I think I was five years old, and we went to, we went to Panama City. It was, I was five and I think Gretchen was like, had just turned two maybe, um, or was almost two and, or just, just turned two. Yeah. Just turned two. And so she was a little bitty and it was me, it was my family and, um, my grandparents, my mom's parents who lived in Franklin. And, um, I remember us going down there and we, we stayed at this place. And, and it was, I mean, back then, this is 1977, um, you know, it, it was fairly nice. It was called Porter's Court, and it was right on the beach, and had a pool, and it was beachside, and had, you know, all kinds of cool places to be. And I remember on the way down there, like, I wanted to get, like, a float. And so we go in this place somewhere in, like, South Alabama, like Dothan or somewhere around there, you know, like mm -hmm. down, uh, whatever, uh, shoot highway 231, I guess. 231, sure. 231. And, uh, so we stop at this place and my grandfather takes me in. He's like, Hey, you just pick out one and you get it. And I was like, Oh, awesome. So I look up on the wall and there's this, you know, probably four by six float of a giant confederate flag and i thought that was the coolest thing i'd ever seen because my uncle had a confederate flag you know, like you know sitting in his you know hanging in his garage or, or like they, it was just like a decor i didn't i was five years old and i had just seen that and you know i was like oh that i recognize that i'm gonna get i'm gonna get that so I get this rebel flag, that huge thing that when you blow it up, you could see it from space. I mean, it's like enormous. And so it was big enough for, you know, a person to lay on, just lay out, out flat on. And so we get down there 
And so my mom and me go down there and we go down to the beach and when I got my float, you know, so there's this little toe headed kid and his mom dragging this thing out there. So mom gets on. And now remember, I can't swim. I'm like four or five. Okay. Can't swim. No floaties, nothing like that. So I go out in the ocean. Mom gets on this raft, right? So I just, there's, it's got these little white cords around it, you know, to hold on to it with. And I just start walking and she's laying on the raft and I guess she fell asleep or just kind of like had her eyes closed, sunbathing or whatever. And I'm just, I'm just, I just keep walking, keep walking. And you know, like there's like a sandbar and then there's a sandbar, like, like the second one out. I go like to the second one and I'm like, you know, my head's barely, you know, I'm going like this, you know, bouncing up off the, you know, hold, I'm holding on now to the raft. I can't even touch, uh, touch the, 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 uh, the bottom of the ocean there at the point where we're at. And, uh, so we're dangerously close to being out in the open ocean. And, uh, my mom just kind of turns over and she looks and the shore is like, looks like it's a quarter of a mile away. I mean, we're probably 200 yards offshore. And she freaks out. And so we, it takes us, because of the current, it takes us like two hours to get back in. Uh, and she's freaking out the whole time. But I will never forget that, um, mainly because she never let me forget it. Um, now, that was, that, was before, uh, that was before Jaws came out, because once I saw Jaws and listened to the soundtrack from Jaws, you are getting me that far out in the ocean. Forget about it. Um, but interesting story to piggyback that is once we, I can remember years later, like when I was a senior in high school. So this is 12 years later, 13 years later, going back to Panama City, driving by Porter's Court. It was the biggest dump I had ever seen. <laughs> It was so run down and it was one, it was basically one of those, it had become one of those places that only kids go to because it was so cheap, you know, and it was just, right. and I, I just remember going, man, how the, how the great have fallen, dude. Yeah. Because I mean, I had such great memories of it and Porter's court, man. And I'd be, I would want, I'd wonder if it's still there. If it's still there, I, it's pretty, I'm sure it's condemned at this point because it was it was in pretty bad pretty ill ill repair in the late 80s i guarantee it's it's been replaced at this point but it was a great trip it was a week long great trip um and we've had some we've had some great trips down to florida um that was one that it was the most memorable uh for me and you said you had those two um i also went my parents took myself and leslie uh and Gretchen and her boyfriend at the time uh, to the beach one year. Uh, and we had a great time then too. Uh, we rented jet skis and rented mopeds and the whole nine yards. And it, it was a lot of fun. Um, mainly because my parents were paying for the whole thing. <laughs> I any, and I didn't have any money. So, but it was a lot, it was a lot of fun. And, and uh, so, uh, you know, Florida for me is always, I, my family's beach family. So, um, Whenever we can get to the beach, we're going to try to head down there. But anyway, hope you guys enjoyed that human interest and a little bit of a, a tribute to Don Shula as well as the Korean baseball organization. I know Paul's, the dinos? Paul's, Paul's uh, setting his DVR for the Dinos next game. For Paul Brees, I'm Adam Freeman. You've been listening to and watching Drive Through Sports with Adam and Paul.